carbon vanish. I think we all agree that would be a dream come true. It would be a breakthrough in fighting climate change. Three guys decided to team up. Artist Ab Verheggen, scientist Bob Hogendorn, and executive Theo Bouts, who most of you probably know from Egon, Zurich and Allianz. It seems like an odd combination of competencies, but it provided the key to really think out of the box and come up with a mind-blowing solution that perhaps could save us all. Please give them a big hand. Carbon Vanish. Up to start with you, the whole Carbon Vanish journey started in Greenland. Yes, it's... Uh, Can you tell us something about that? <laughs> My name is Up Vregge. Thank you that you uh, yeah, joined the, the, the presentation. Uh, I worked for many years in the, in the Arctic, in the, the north of Canada, Greenland, Spitsbergen, Russia. And uh, during this time I noticed that the climate changed very dramatically. And uh, it's going twice as fast as in the, these uh, regions. And uh, we, documentary, we documented these, uh, uh, you know, this disaster was happening over there, but in that time, it was 2010, it wasn't nearly uh, known around us, among us, and the people were more in a, in a, in a fight together, denial. So uh, I'm an artist, so I said, I make a huge uh, art project, and with my art project, I tell everybody what's happening here. So uh, with, uh, with a helicopter, I placed two huge sculptures on a drifting iceberg, and uh, we invited uh, CNN, and uh, it was brought in the news worldwide. And this was a perfect communication method to reach the audience. So uh, I learned a lot from the Inuit, and uh, it's a beautiful country, but it's changing very fast. And I was very uh, uh, nervous that if these changes reach, reach our attitudes, we have a huge problem, and that's uh, the oh, Greenland story. So uh, you went there, you saw the, uh, your artwork on the iceberg melting and melting, and uh, was that the, the, the time where you got the idea, okay, let's, let's, let's turn this around and let's see how we can use solar energy to uh, actually create something? Yeah, to give you a, a kind of a, a, an impression, when you have an when you have a, 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 an iceberg with the sides where we placed the sculptures on, normally it would drift for six years. And uh, the iceberg started to drift in April, but in June it already sunk. Instead of minus 20, it was plus 20 degrees Celsius. So uh, when I came home, I thought, we are in deep problem when this comes back. So I thought, the icebergs in the north are melting, but are we people able to find solutions to cope with climate change. So uh, uh, I came up with the idea, I want to make a kind of an, 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 an icon for human ingenuity. So I want to build a new iceberg in the middle of a hot and dry desert. Are we capable to do that? And, and that's, that's basically what brought you to your project in Dubai. Yeah. Um, the, the, the result was in, uh, in uh, Dubai at the uh, World Expo and I designed the technology of an artwork, it's a complete artwork, and we created, uh, unbelievably, with solar, uh, uh, solar cells, uh, we built a waterfall that generated between 1,000 and 2,000 liters of water out of the dry desert air and we released it and one time, boom, down, so that people could experience how it was to be in a desert and you have too much cold water. And all the water we use to grow plants, and this is what you see, the, the, my, my story, how I designed it, was projected on umbrellas. And on a certain moment, the water uh, uh, flashes down and we use it to, uh, uh, to generate and complete of the grid ecosystem. So basically what you did is you put solar panels on the roof, then 
that solar panels were used, all the energy was used to distract water from the air, yeah. from the dry air actually. Yeah. And that condensated, you turn it into water and actually you gathered so much water that you could turn it into a waterfall multiple times a day. Yes, we did it. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the water that we produced was incredible, even in the very, very uh, dry period of the year. But there's also the idea of being an artist. I see things different. Uh, when I read the newspapers, I say, it's getting dry. I said, okay, but from the other side, the earth is heating up and we get more moisture in the air. That's a, that's, that's a, a common of, of a logic uh, a result of the, of the climate change. So I thought, why don't we use climate change in our advantage? So if we have more water in the air, we have to, to get it out. We are living in an ocean of water, even if it's dry, but we can't see it, we can touch it. The other thing is, uh, gravity, air and sunshine is free for everybody, everywhere in the world. And I use these three elements to design a new method for condensation. And that's why we could build a, a complete autonomously running uh, uh, ecosystem in the middle of a desert. Uh, I think it's a great because you, know, like you actually uh, are giving people in deserts the opportunity to have fresh water, clean water, uh, without being connected to a well or a grid. It's just they can take it from the air. Yeah, we, um, I made uh, in Amsterdam a couple of years ago, I uh, built an uh, ecosystem, a Dutch ecosystem, and we grow uh, grains indoor. It was completely uh, off the grid. The water we extracted from the air and we recycled the water inside uh, uh, the, the greenhouse. And so we grow food. And uh, uh, it, was an, it was an art project, but uh, now we are starting up to building a factory to produce these machines near Eindhoven. And uh, maybe in uh, one or two years we can uh, produce thousands of these machines for the whole world. And that's what you're actually already doing, right? Yes. Production, plants, and make, creating this, uh, uh, this solution, uh, making it applicable at scale. Yeah, but it's not completely my uh, piece of cake. I'm not a director <laughs> of... Uh, no, I, I like the ideas and the art around it. No, but yeah, you know, like, I, I think that what you, what you tell us is that um, if you look at things uh, from a different perspective, you come up with quite different solutions that are really breathtaking, I think. Thank you, but... Uh, it's also that uh, the communication with your audience is very important. You can design uh, uh, a great technology, but you have to show it. You have to make people to, to give it a feeling. And I think that's very important as an artist to present a piece of art showing and explaining new technology. So and art is just not just a path to new knowledge? Uh, what you just explained, but also a way to communicate much yeah. better to a, to a much larger audience. Yeah, you, your audience is uh, very broad, instead of uh, uh, complex scientific studies. Well, uh, scientific studies, Let, let's jump to Bob then. <laughs> because Bob, you're, you're the, odd, the odd guy in this uh, group, right? I'm not sure if I'm the old guy, uh, but isn't it great to have so much enthusiasm? You I'm immediately. Uh, <laughs> You're a scientist, so what, yeah. do, what actually do you do? Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm a geologist by training here in Amsterdam. I did my PhD in Delft, where I also was an assistant professor, and then I went to work to at uh, Deltares, which is our national institute for water and the subsurface, and, which is nice because I saw some flooding discussions here this morning, and I think. Uh, we can really relate there on the, on the risks, but that's not why I'm here, of course. But we also did some side projects using olivine to capture carbon, and that's uh, my first uh, so step. Olivine, olivine, is that, what has that to do with olives, or what is it? <laughs> no, a little bit, because it's green, okay. so that's where it gets its name from, so in that way you're correct. But uh, uh, olivine is a silicium uh, magnesium uh, oxide. Uh, to make it a little bit boring now. <laughs> no, I'm getting more interested. <laughs> it's, it's, and, but what's important, it's the most abundant mineral in the upper part of the Earth crust. Most abundant? Yes. So, I mean, it, it, it occurs a lot. Yeah. It's in, uh, and everywhere where you see rocks outcropping or volcanic activity present or in the past, you will find olivine. 
Oh wow! So yeah. it's it's a it's a resource that's available practically everywhere. Yep, that's correct. And uh, are they currently using it for something else, or is it something that they? It's being mined in uh, in Norway quite actively, but also in Spain, Portugal, Turkey, and uh, so so it's, uh, so there's lots of activity, and it's mined especially for the steel and aluminum industry. Okay, okay. And that's used as a as a, as a kind of uh, byproduct to to for their processing. Okay, so. Um, I didn't know it, but at least it isn't rare. No. But uh, um, what is then so special about it if it's not rare? The, 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 the unique property of olivine is that when it weathers, that means that it, uh, it, it, it uh, transforms to a different mineral at the Earth's surface, by water, by rain, by, by sun, all the forces that are there, it uh, binds CO2. Can, in you a natural explain, can, you, can you explain that a bit, how that works? So, so you have the original material, you have uh, uh, the, the atmosphere in contact with it, because normally it's buried, and it comes to the uh, to this earth surface, the, it comes in contact with the atmosphere, and then uh, a normal chemical reaction happens with every type of rock or mineral that will happen, and then uh, it binds CO2 to itself and it becomes a, a chalk-like substance. Okay, so uh, that's great news, yep. especially if we have it in such abundance. So, um, at what speed is that happening? Yes, yeah, so, so, so the normal process is really slow. So you must say it's, it's kind of a balance between volcanic activity and the natural surroundings that it binds this CO2, but really slow. You must think in decades, which is geological seem fast, but on a human scale, and the amount of CO2 we produce... Not fast enough. Not fast enough. Okay, so that's not such a good news then. No, so when we did some projects, and we call that nature-based projects, is we deposited the, the, the olivine on roads and pathways to bind CO2. But uh, we want to gain more attention to these projects, and that's when I called up, because I was very familiar with his work that he presented so enthusiastically, combining science and art, which is a great way of communicating to show people that it works. But then you can show how it works, but if it stays within like decades to yeah. solving the problem... So, then so, so, so when we set this up and we first had concepts and, and, yeah, and doing a, a brainstorm of up is really intense, and we had really big ideas how to visualize this process, and we thought in terms of weeks, days, uh, how to make it visible that you have this slur sh slow turnover of CO2 binding with this olivine. But then we did the experiments and was immediately, uh, so it went really fast. So you thought it would, the process would be slower, Yes. but because of the projects that you did together, you found out that you could reduce those decades to minutes minutes, minutes. my god yeah. so that's really a, a solution to what uh, to the problems yeah. that we're facing yes absolutely yeah, yeah. Can, so, you, so can, can you share a bit more about that process because i think that you know, like it looks it sounds too good to be true <laughs> of course there's always uh, uh, downsides uh, so there are, uh, no, no, i only want to hear the process yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, the, the process is really simple, it's textbook stuff, and uh, we just found a way to easily accelerate it using a, a, a simple, uh, what we call uh, boerenverstand. So it's textbooks, meaning that it's recognized, well-known, Yeah, yeah. it's a process that is in place. Yeah, so about 20 years ago was uh, uh, Olaf Schuiling, a professor in Utrecht, who first came with the concept uh, to use olivine to, to combat CO2 emissions or CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And that, uh, uh, so, but but we did, what did you guys do then exactly <laughs> to speed up the process from decades to minutes? Uh, exactly, you it's a know. miracle. <laughs> a lot of praying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 it's, it's uh, how do you call it serendipity? Yeah. So you have exactly. all the ingredients there, and you find something, and now we try to accelerate it. And uh, so you found it. something through serendipity, and that's what you're now trying to industrialize. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and I'm, I, I got the idea, I'm getting the idea that you're not going to share more, right? Uh, no, you, <laughs> I'm not sure how to say, but it, it, it will need a little bit more time and attention to share uh, the, 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 the details. I think there's a little video also on uh, Carbon Vanish. Um, it's just imagery, but anyway, okay. it just shows also how fast, because this is your... Um, the, the, the kind of yeah. uh, project it's, that you built, yeah. and also it shows how fast the the absorption is taking place, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a movie, it's on the website, I think, this is the one. Yeah. 
and uh, uh, it, it shows the process and the, the simplicity of it. So and here it says 425. Yeah, which is the normal concentration, maybe in this room, because there's so many people a little bit higher already. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's the ambient uh, control you showed and then, in. So and this is the original artwork. And then what uh, up put and then on top? A couple of minutes later, it's uh, 216. Okay, wow. So it's already half. Yes. And 216 is about the levels yet pre-industrial. Okay, pre-industrial. Yes. So if we would apply this massive scale, we would be returning to the late 18th century. Probably, yeah. It Probably. depends a bit on you, how you manage it and organize it and uh, where trade forward. Now you hear the scientists eh, being, uh, looking for the nuance and the uncertainty and well, uh, what we want to achieve. It's certainly a breakthrough. Uh, uh, Theo, what do you think? It definitely is a breakthrough. Uh, it's a breakthrough in a way that I think that um, the CO2 problem will vanish. There won't be a within, CO2 problem anymore? No, within a foreseeable time with developments like this and certainly with something like carbon vanish, we will get control of the CO2 problem. But there will be another issue that you already alluded to. Pre-industrial was around 280, 280 parts per million. Um, what I worry a bit about uh, already is which is the institute, which is the body that will set the global level of PPM for the future. Is it 280 ppm or even an optimum below or above that? But there should be a global body that is going to determine that, otherwise we are in deep shit. Of course, but uh, I think that between now and then there's it's still... less shit than we are in now, <laughs> by the way. Exactly. <laughs> there's, there's still a few steps to make, probably. Yes. Yeah, but... Uh, but one of the things that I thought when I, when, I, when I got acquainted with your concept is that basically you're building a... Uh, a factory for carbon rights. Yes, carbon rights is of course in vogue. Um, and of course, opportunistic as we are, we will issue and sell carbon rights. Um, and actually, there is a big market developing there. And it's, it's nearing a trillion dollars, which is huge. But also the, the price of carbon The prices rights is are, are going up. And nonetheless, I think that this market is finite because there is not, it's pushing around lots of rights. There is not too much CO2 reduced. Yeah. Uh, so that will um, be coming to an end. It takes five to 10 years. But in the meantime, everybody is welcome to talk with us about the carbon rights. Yeah, I can imagine. So, um, I love the solution that I saw. Uh, we also saw the, the project that is in place. What does it take to bring this to a way larger scale? And these uh, kind of large innovations, I know also from the past, you, you always have to think about what, what are the next steps. So of course, there is, um, we are talking with uh, customers and some of them uh, in the traditional world and some of them uh, are even uh, in the government world, which is more traditional than traditional companies. And there you get the question, what about the residual risk? So there are residual risks. Uh, there is a little bit of zinc that, Nic is nickel. Nickel that is produced as a byproduct, but there is also magnesium carbonate uh, produced as a byproduct. That is a positive because that can be used uh, by the concrete industry uh, to build new forms of concrete, so that is a positive. But f to get away the risk, we are still looking for a insurer, reinsurer who wants to innovate with us in, in this direction. So that is one. You have to take care of these kind of risk. And the second one is accelerating. So um, we are also talking to lots of uh, strategic investors who are very interested in this, big banks, big asset managers. Uh, but there we are looking for a strategic uh, fit. Uh, so uh, that is what is hindering us now to accelerate uh, very heavily. All the science is done, all the experiments are done. Our piece of art is ready to launch. And we are hesitating a bit to tell you exactly how it works because the patterns are still pending. Okay, well, um, looking forward to uh, a better world. And uh, yes. thank you for making those huge steps. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is it